Grace to you and peace be multiplied through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's a delight to be here with you. My mother does not care for the plain suit, what I'm wearing here this morning, but I am wearing it in part to honor her. I'm a paradox, aren't I? The title of the message today is, Are the Turtles Beating Us? <clears throat> I can do that. Are the Turtles Beating Us? And I'm particularly, if I might say it, gunning for the young men who are largely in this section. Monte's back there, Neil, LaVon, Carter, Edward, Bradlin. It's for all of us, but as young men, you are on the verge of the critical decade. You're on the verge of making choices that will have giant impact for the rest of your life in the years to come. Several years ago, I listened to a book by a man named Daniel Coyle, not a believer that I know of, not even necessarily a religious man, but he asked this interesting question that piqued my thoughts. Why, he asked, do certain groups add up to be greater than the sum of their parts, while others add up to be less? Why are some groups able to affect some influence way out of proportion to what they are, while others who are larger actually have less influence? He went on to answer that question with this observation, group blank is one of the most powerful forces on the planet. What do you think that word is in that blank? Group blank. Unity? Unity? Group culture. Group Culture is one of the most powerful forces on the planet. So what is culture, and why is it especially powerful as it's lived out in a group? I like a definition of culture that Andy Crouch adapted from Ken Myers. He says, culture is what we make of the world. That's a very broad definition, of course. Culture is what we make of the world. Culture brings together our beliefs, our values, and our practices to shape us into the kind of people that we are, both individually but especially corporately. The culture of Shippensburg is different than our sister church at St. Thomas, and it's different than our sister church at Chambersburg Christian Fellowship, and our sister church in Chile, and our sister church in West Virginia. Even though we are related churches... Every one of our groups have a unique culture. <clears throat> Is it possible to live culture-free? That's a question that has been raised over the years. Is it possible for a church to be culture-free? I don't think so. I believe that culture is pervasive and invasive because God has created the reality of culture. Culture is everywhere. Is it possible for a church to have too much culture? <laughs> Some people probably think so. The reality is culture is never thin. In other words, culture always has a way of doing things. There is no culture where people end up experiencing the color yellow and they don't have a word for it. <laughs> culture fills in all the gaps. It helps us to make sense of the world. Somebody somewhere will always create culture and so it is always full, you could say. They never we never experience culture as thin or lacking. So on the bigger scale, when we talk about group culture, it is what we are making of the world together. 
What, brothers and sisters, are we making of the world here at Shippensburg Christian Fellowship and in the surrounding area? Whether we want to or not, no group can avoid the materialization and manifestation of culture. It's going to happen, <laughs> whether you want it to or not. Jeff Henderson has noted that your culture is determined by default or by design. It'll happen accidentally, or you can make it happen on purpose. I think that group culture is a part of God's good design for his world. And I think that a good, strong group culture confronts one of our biggest struggles as human beings. It's a struggle that was alluded to in Sunday school. And this is the main drive this morning, the main thrust. Our biggest problem, brothers and sisters, is not an inability to conform. It is an unwillingness to yield. That's our problem. It's the I. It's the self. It's the insistence that I must have my way. Our main problem is not an inability to conform, but an unwillingness to yield. Now, my interest in culture goes back at least 12 or 13 years to my opportunity to meet Andy Crouch, who wrote the book Culture Making, and to hear him give a lecture on it. But since that time, of course, I've done other reading and listening, and of course, John D. being my father-in-law, has uh, only added wood to the fire and fanned the flames of thinking about the importance and power and inescapability of culture. In fact, how many of you are aware that John wrote a booklet within the last year or so on culture? How many of you raise of hands? Okay, I'm going to say 65.3%. Uh, how many of you have read this booklet? Okay, that's about 43.2%. <laughs> there are some extra copies here if you're interested in taking a look at it to find out what all the hubbub's about. I was asked to give four sessions on culture back in January to a men's conference, and those messages can be found at Living Hope Christian Fellowship website. <clears throat> we have all been influenced by group culture. We experience life typically in groups, family groups, civic groups, national groups. And so I, of course, have been influenced in how I see culture as a group. I wanted to give you a brief autobiography of me, where I came from, how I've been influenced by culture, and hence some of these pictures that you have today. I'm going back to my grandfather, my dad's dad, Alan Byler. He was raised Amish in the 30s and 40s in central Pennsylvania here in Big Valley, about an hour and a half north of here. And as an Amish man, his mother led him to the Lord. He had a relationship with God, and he developed an interest in mission work, which the Amish at that time were not engaged in. My grandfather never joined the Amish. He took some drafting classes to learn how to draw blueprints, and he had an interest in doing building on the mission field. Eunice Hartman was a young lady who grew up in northern Indiana in the Goshen area. She attended the Goshen uh, College and graduated with a four-year degree in teaching in 1948. She then applied for mission work in Africa under Mennonite missions. She boarded a ship called the Kota Getty, and it was a, I forget, four or six-week voyage across the ocean to go to Ethiopia where she taught. And she had other co-teachers, of course. Uh, one of her co-teachers was the emperor of Ethiopia's daughter, uh, Haile Selassie, one of his daughters. And uh, Haile Selassie was very favorable toward mission work among his people, or granddaughter, I should say, of Haile Selassie. And so uh, they had that, that connection. Meanwhile, my grandfather also went some months later 
not knowing my grandmother, and began building schools and clinics for Mennonite missions. In the course of time, uh, they met and started dating, and they decided to get married there in Ethiopia, the capital of Ethiopia, Addis Ababa, in 1952. My grandmother coming from a Mennonite background, my grandfather coming from an Amish background. They took their honeymoon in Yemen. They proceeded to do several terms of service there in Africa. They had a number of children, and then eventually they moved back to Big Valley, central Pennsylvania here, to take over the home farm, my grandfather's home farm. In the course of those years, my dad and his whole family were going to a small Mennonite church where there weren't any youth. And so my dad and his brother, somewhere around the ages of Carter and Edward, began to run with the Brethren in Christ youth group and do things with them. And eventually, the whole family joined the Brethren in Christ church there in Big Valley. Uh, my dad met my mom through different connections. She was raised Brethren in Christ in another place, and they ended up getting married in 1978. And then I showed up on the scene in 1979 as the, uh, the oldest grandchild on that, that side of the family. We lived in the Big Valley area for the first four years of my life and were part of the Brother in Christ Church there, which I don't have memories of. And then my father was interested in mission work as well and decided to go to Mennonite missions in northwestern Ontario. So from central PA to Northwestern Ontario was a trip of 1,500 miles, 30-some hours driving. Uh, we traveled. I was four years old. I had a brother two years younger than me who was two, and I had a sister who was, I believe, eight weeks. And uh, we traveled all the way up to Red Lake, which is the end of the road, and then flew another 80 or 100 miles north to Poplar Hill Development School, which was a school for... Indian children, or as we call them now, First Nations children, who were brought in from various reservations to be there at Poplar Hill for the school year. They would go home over Christmas time, they would go home over uh, summer break in the summertime, but we were there with a group of about 50 staff and about 50 students from the time I was four years old till I was 11, seven years that we spent there at Poplar Hill. It was a tremendous experience, even though it was isolated. There were no roads there. Everything had to be flown in. Uh, we had our own sawmill, our own school building, and also our chapel area, a shop fully equipped, a gymnasium, a dormitory, housing for the staff, and one of the best things for a boy, a full-size regulation hockey rink, which we actually able could, could use six months of the year because they actually have winter up there. Um, and, of course, we could skate on the lake as well when it froze over. There was all kinds of activities to do. But this was a tremendous group culture experience. You talk about isolation. Uh, we had our own generators for our power system, but we couldn't power anything real uh, heavy duty. So all the staff were limited to things that were 1,500 watts and less. That, that ruled out a lot of your hair dryers. Uh, <laughs> The dormitory did have ice, uh, had uh, refrigerators and freezers, but in our homes, we had ice boxes, and the water was carried from the dormitory to the various homes. So uh, we had our bucket for water, we had outhouses, um, we, had, we had electric lights in our homes, we had our own telephone system, we had the old crank phones, and our number was one long and two shorts. And of course, everybody on campus knows who's being called when they hear what number is being uh, rung. And if you want to get everybody on for an emergency or something, you, I forget what it was, if it was 10 longs, but um, anyway, that was, that was a way to be connected. <clears throat> it was a tremendous place to grow up as far as the interactions, being friends with the First Nations youth, going to school with them. Uh, everything came in on planes. Uh, when the lake was open, it was float planes. In the wintertime, when the lake froze over, it was ski planes. 
And um, so we had as many as five planes a day that were supplying our mission. Not big planes, mind you, but uh, Cessna and, and a little larger uh, sizes. The mail, our food, visitors, everything had to come in on planes. Uh, there was, in the wintertime, a winter road that could be built, and a skidder or a tractor could drive out across there, but we had no cars where we were at. There were about 50 students, which included the staff children as well. And so we made friends. I went to school with young people my age by the name of Jeanette Wesley and Ronaldo Kitish and Ruben Neekin and Grace Umbosch. And uh, it was a, an interesting time. We had a lot of activities together as a group. There was every day after school. When I was done with school, I would go out to the hockey rink with my friends. We'd play hockey, go ice skating. There was sledding. There was snowshoeing. There was snowmobiling. There was ice fishing. And that's just the winter sports. And uh, there were times that we would get together as a whole school, and they would do uh, snow sculpturing. You know, and we would have uh, bannock bakes, where the, the girls would have to get the wood and build the fire and see who could be the fastest to get their bannock from mixed up with the fire going and made to being able to, to eat it. Uh, just lots of enjoyable things. We had track and field day. Uh, we did various things. Once every Friday night, we did something together as a group. It might involve going to the ice rink. Uh, it might involve having reel-to-reel -reel films, uh, watching you know, Anna Green Gables or whatever. But it was group involvement. It was togetherness, and it was being, having fun together in the midst of all the work that that entailed as well. The men would go out. The ice on the lake would often get to be two feet thick. And so they would go out and cut blocks of ice for our ice boxes. Remember, we had a sawmill, and so they would take the sawdust from the sawmill, take it to the ice house, a little house that was uh, there on the campus, and they would pack that, those blocks of ice in there with the sawdust, and it would keep the blocks of ice all year until the next fall, late fall, when the lake would freeze over again and we could get more ice. But I remember my dad would go up and get a block of ice about once a week to bring down to our, our ice box. We, had to, we went through a lot of wood. All of our buildings were heated with wood. I think it was about 200 cords a year. And so there were firewood crews that would come up and help with that cutting process. A number of the bigger stoves would take the four-foot lengths, and so they could just throw that log wood in whole, and it would, it would last quite a while. And we had a, a specific man. He was called the freight and fireman who would make the rounds, making sure that the gymnasium, the shop, the school, the dorm were all taken care of as far as uh, the fires. And they would also meet the planes and deal with the cargo, the freight that was coming in, the freight that's going out. When I was 11, we moved back home to um, Pennsylvania to take over my, my dad's home farm there, where my grandparents were. A number of you are familiar with Big Valley, probably all of you. And so we moved to between Belleville and Reedsville, there in Big Valley. My grandparents had a farm that wasn't quite 100 acres, and that's where I spent my teen years and my early 20s. In that context, we were, again, with the Brethren in Christ Church. I was growing up, my brother and I, with the youth there, but we didn't feel like we entirely fit in. The church had acculturated some, and so uh, Laurel can tell you this. She was very young, and uh, anyway. We started to run with her youth group, with the, the uh, Beachy Amish youth group there in Big Valley, and my brother and I found a real camaraderie with them. Uh, yeah, we were engaged with our youth group, but, and we were doing things like Bible quizzing with the broader Brother in Christ denomination, but that was putting us in interaction with girls that were quizzing with shorts and t-shirts and, and uh, things that were just very different from how we were growing up. And um, so there again, we, we experienced the power of group culture in this sense in a beachy context. And it was a very beneficial experience for my brother and, and me. If you're familiar with the Brethren in Christ at all, and you know there are some around here in this area, they have three main streams of influence in their heritage. They have the Anabaptist influence, the Pietist influence, and then later in their history, the Holiness influence. In the 18, they, they, they developed around the late 1700s is when they arose, somewhat organically, and became 
they were known, first of all, as uh, River Brethren. In the 1860s, there was a three-way split, which resulted in the more liberal group, which was the United Zion, the more middle of the road, you could say, the Brethren in Christ, and the more conservative group, the River Brethren. So bookmark River Brethren in your mind. So we moved to the farm. We tried to find our identity as young people with a youth group that was different than we were, but very similar in values. A little bit different in practice in some things. And what to make sense of all that. And I'm, I'm talking to you young men. You're thinking about your future. You're thinking about your identity. You're thinking about where will I commit myself? Where will I give myself to? Who will I become? I went off to a conservative uh, holiness Bible college. Oh, yeah, I did want to show you in Big Valley. There's lots of culture in Big Valley. Cultures. <laughs> so I grew up with three different colors of buggies. There's the black buggies, the horse, the, the Amish, and then there are yellow buggy Amish, which incidentally are called Byler Amish. And then there are the white top buggies. The white toppers are Nebraska Amish. And I actually worked at a Nebraska Amish sawmill. I drove the loader in my, my mid-teens, and uh, since they weren't allowed to, and I, I drove that for my, my father. And then I went off to a conservative holiness Bible college when I was 19. Penview Bible Institute is located also in central PA here. It's close to Lewisburg. It's in the town of Penns Creek. And... The conservative holiness have a spec, or the, the holiness churches are on a whole continuum, much like the Anabaptist churches, okay? So we know that we have conservative Anabaptists all the way to liberal Anabaptists. There are conservative holiness all the way to liberal holiness. There's just a wide range of holiness groups. But some of the uh, cultural things about the conservative holiness would be the wearing of the tie and the wearing of the suit, dressing up for preaching and for ministering, and even for going to class. As a student, all young men were required to wear, at, at the least, a shirt and tie for class. And I didn't have any conviction against it, and so I wore a shirt and tie. And in fact, it was often encouraged for special meetings, revivals, and whatever, for the young men to wear suits as well, coats or entire suits. And... Uh, dress up for, for those occasions and for those events. Um, as you may well know, the women do not wear a material covering, but they consider the long hair up, typically worn up, as the covering. And I heard a lot of good messages about keeping the scissors out of the hair. I think that's a very important thing. Keep the scissors out of your hair. It is a glory. It's a beauty. And... That is something that God has given to you as a blessing. One, another thing that they're also very strong on is three-quarter length sleeves or longer. Uh, no short sleeves, but the wearing of something that is appropriate in length so that one cannot see into the upper torso in any sort of engagement, whether it's work or worship or whatever it is. And so that was, of course, required for, for class and for being there at college. They're very big on music and singing and playing instruments. A friend of mine who moved from, an, from a brother in Christ setting to a nationwide setting, he, he made the observation, he said that uh, the holiness style of singing is very triumphant <laughs> and the Anabaptist style of singing is very meditative. And there's value to both of those. And he wasn't trying to pick any bones. One of the things that was really stressed, I did not major in ministerial studies, I majored in missionary studies the four years that I was there, but I had a, I had a my best friend was a, a ministerial major, and so he would bring back all that he was learning from uh, the, the man that was leading that, that department, and uh, the man who led that department was very strong that all the Penview preacher boys should look a certain way. They needed to wear an appropriate suit, they needed to have a proper tie, not too flashy. They need to have black shoes that were shined. 
they needed to carry with them into the pulpit a black Bible. They needed to have a certain sense about them of the seriousness of God's word. That made an impression on me, even though I wasn't one of the preacher boys. But it impressed on me the power, the importance of group culture. It was over that time that I developed my conviction to wear sleeves that were three-quarter length. And I still do that as a construction worker today. Now, I roll my sleeve above my elbow when I work, of course. But uh, that conviction not to be able to see into the upper torso, it developed under the auspices of a group culture, a very defined group culture. And I'm not putting that on anyone else. I'm saying it's a good way to go. When I was 24, I began pastoring a small Brother in Christ church. And I pastored that church for 10 years, from the time I was 24 until I was 34. The church had about 20 people when I went there and about 40 people when I left. It was a fairly diverse group. All of the ladies in my church who were members wore some sort of covering on their head. And of course, I preached it. I felt very strongly about it. But I also... uh, Regularly, when I preach Sunday morning, Sunday night, suit and tie, suit and tie. And when I conducted the Wednesday evening prayer meetings, it was always a shirt and tie. Always dressing up, always uh, wanting to make sure that I am giving a proper um, presentation for what I was sharing. It was during my time there at Pleasant Valley, I began to dig into the Brother in Christ history and all the things that have been jettisoned as unnecessary and arbitrary and legalistic, and where that kind of thinking ended up taking the brethren in Christ. And I don't have any bones to pick with the brethren in Christ. I love them. I left on very good terms, but I learned a lot, and there's a lot of sorrow about what took place there. When I speak to you about group culture, I'm not speaking out of a vacuum. I'm speaking out of something that is personal to me. And a desire for us as a group of people here to do well. It was during those years I began to hear teachings about the kingdom. And I heard messages from David Berceau and John D. Martin that started to shape my thinking. And I developed a personal mantra that said this, I want to embrace truth no matter how it changes me. I don't care how it changes me, I want to embrace truth. I also began to think about an eight-generation, 200-year vision for my family, even though I wasn't married. That may sound audacious, but I'm challenging you young men to think about that. God willing, someday you're going to lead a family, and I'm challenging you to think about the eight generations as the Lord tarries, the 200 years in the future. And what that does is it helps to sharpen your focus about the choices that you are making today the places you're going, the people that you're associating with. It was at that time I began casting vision for the church, the Pleasant Valley Church, to leave the brethren in Christ. And in the end, they voted to stay, which was fine. But I realized I had to to leave. And we had parted under very good conditions. Nine months later, Heather and I were married. And there's a whole story related to that. Many of you are part of that story. I should say that toward the end of my time at Pleasant Valley, the last year that I was there, I took off my tie as a a desire to identify more closely or moving in the direction of identifying with the plain people. And that's what I was casting vision for my church to become, was to leave the Brother in Christ and become more purposeful in their attire. So I was still wearing the lapel, and I did that until 2018. <clears throat> Heather and I got married June 28 of 2014. Again, many of you were part of that. Thank you for all the work you put into it. It was a tumultuous time because we're bringing two worlds together. If I'd had my druthers, I would have gotten married in a tuxedo. But that was not to be. And I look back on that, and I don't really care. Actually, I appreciate the things that Uh, the changes I had to make in relation to that time. But we did have lapel uh, coats at our wedding. We didn't do it in a corner or secretly. I met with the brothers here at Shippensburg. I had 
No concept of a church wedding. I didn't understand why two people who are committed to Christ can't have their own wedding. Why does the church have to meddle in this sort of stuff? But I didn't want to just stick a finger in the eye either. I wanted to be open with, there are things about our wedding that aren't going to be Shippensburg because I'm not Shippensburg. I'm me. You know, I was raised brother in Christ. I'm brother in Christ pastor. After we were married, we moved to the Lewisburg area where I had work, and we began attending a small church there. I was brought up short while we were there by some of the casualness that was represented in that congregation. It's a church, again, of dear people with whom we are friends. It was made up of people that I would call families, disaffected conservative holiness and disaffected conservative Anabaptist people coming together to do a church plant. <laughs> Let's have church together. The families were conservative, by and large. And it worked because every father had a vision of what a conservative family in his mind should look like. So he knew what he expected of his wife, he knew what he expected of his children, and they pretty much towed the line. What came quickly to the surface was the fact that these fathers, as strong as they were with their various ideas of conservatism, were not willing to demonstrate to their wives and children the very yieldedness that they expected of them. What do I mean by that? I think every father should be strong about what he expects of his wife and children, but he also needs to be willing to demonstrate yieldedness by coming under a bigger group than himself and joining himself to a brotherhood. That could not happen at the church that we were attending. We tried, I tried, I tried to call them to come together to unity, that we would come together and, and, and yield one to another, and it couldn't happen. I got so frustrated, but you know what? It was so good for me because it helped me to start grasping a sense of what it means to be a church. It's not just the preacher standing up and preaching, it's brotherhood. It's important to have this group culture. And I was forced to reckon with that. In the midst of that, we had a couple from conservative background, old order background. And he was regularly coming to church with t-shirts that had big pictures on, and sometimes in shorts. And she's wearing a black veil and skirts and blouses. Is this who we want to become? I'm not judging them on their spiritual condition, but I'm saying... These things had an effect. There's no way to bring unity when there's that sort of intentional self-willedness. During that time, I was driving a choir bus for faith builders, and one of the services was at a Mennonite church in Big Valley at Bethel, and they had asked me to preach the Sunday morning message. At that time, I didn't have any plain coats. All I had were lapel suits. And so I asked them what I should do about this. They said, well, if you just wear a white shirt, that's fine. That'll be appropriate, and that won't be any offense to us. And so I was willing to do that, and my parents came to hear me preach that Sunday morning. And sometime later, after everything was all over, my mother came to me. My mother does not like the plain suit particularly. And she said, if what it will take for you to wear a suit when you preach is to have a plain suit, I will give you money to have a suit changed over. I was floored. I could never have seen this coming. That was a shocker. <laughs> but I was raised that when we come to church, we give our best. We present our best. It's not because we think we're better than somebody else, but it's because we recognize that what we wear is saying something about us. And my dad, to this day, he's not ordained, he's not a preacher, but he wears lapel coats almost every Sunday to church. He dresses up. He's giving his best. So in the midst of this swirl with the church that we were at there in the Lewisburg area, Craig and Ann, out of the blue, called and asked, would you be willing to house sit for us 
we'd like to go to Ireland and oversee the boys camp there. And it was a very surprising offer, but it really did seem like the door that God was opening for us. And so we moved to the uh, area here. We visited each one of the sister churches for a month at a time to get a feel for the culture of each one, to get a sense for where we might want to land. I told people that, you know, it's highly likely that we'll come to Shippensburg because this is Heather's home church and this is where her parents are. And it's in close proximity to where we are house sitting for, for Craig and Ann. And of course, that's, that's what happened. I also got a job working for a River Brethren man. Remember that, that word, River Brethren? Um, I didn't know much about them, but I started working with a crew that is entirely River Brethren, a construction crew. And um, we do barn roofs, we do house roofs, we do pole barns, we build different things. And, um, and I'm still working for the same man. The, uh, the employees have changed, but I'm still the only River Brethren non-River Brother guy on the crew. What is so fascinating to me is I've gotten to know the River Brother more, is the, to, to see the culture that they have. They have a group culture that goes back, of course, well over 200 years. And they haven't done things perfectly, but uh, they have a group identity that is settled and that is established. And it feels to me as if because of that settledness, they know that nobody else is like them. I mean, who else is like the River Brother? Nobody, okay? Nobody. Um, they could be mistaken for Amish and Old Order Mennonites, but they are unique. Because of that strong identity, they feel neither superior nor inferior. They just are. That's who they are. I love that. I think that we at Shippensburg could develop a strong group identity, and it's just who we are. We don't have to be superior to anybody else out there or inferior to anybody else. This is who we are. It's a good way to go. It's not the only way. We're not the only church. But a group culture that is high definition, cohesive, and settled. It's a beautiful thing. It's what I've seen among the River Brethren people. And then after being in the area for about a year, we indeed, much to my surprise, applied for membership here at Shippensburg Christian Fellowship. If you had told me we got married, that Brandon, in six years or so, you're going to be asking for membership at Shippensburg, I'd be like, no way. <laughs> that is, those people are way too defined. I mean, they've just got way too many... Too much, uh, too much culture, too much culture. <laughs> so this is my first experience with intentional brotherhood. And I have really appreciated it. Thank you. Has it been hard? Oh yeah, absolutely. Are there disagreements? Pretty much every day. One of the things that I feel like I've learned while I'm here, and I'm offering this as a challenge. You remember I talked about these fathers who were unwilling to submit to something bigger than themselves, a church brotherhood? I think it's important, brothers and sisters, for individual churches, and we are independent. We are non-denominational. We are unaffiliated, whatever word you want to use. It is important for us in this position to be willing to yield to something bigger than ourselves. Shippensburg doesn't have it all. We don't have a corner on perfect. We need a bigger movement. And that's one of my concerns, that we not go off into a corner and assume that we have it all. Just as we as fathers need to yield to a brotherhood, brotherhoods need to yield to a movement. I'm convinced of it. I'm not saying it has to be a denomination or a conference, but a willingness to consult with a broader movement when we make decisions. Because we will influence them and they will influence us. That's the power of group culture. 
And when we tap into a broader movement, what that does is it opens up a whole new world for us. We have opportunities that cannot be offered simply here at little old Shippensburg. Now, because John is my father-in-law, I have access to somebody who's been swimming in the Anabaptist waters for almost 80 years. And I have been tapping his brain about this church and that church and that group and that movement because I want to see how this picture fits together. I want to analyze where things are going. What is the trajectory? Where are the things that are healthy? Where are the things that are unhealthy? Where is their life? Where is their death? What is happening in the broader Anabaptist church family? Are we taking group culture seriously enough? There are so many questions, so few answers. Does the Bible have anything to say about this topic? There are three things I'd like us to consider. One is, I really believe that Jehovah legislated group culture. You see that there in Numbers 15, as God was talking to Moses. He comes there in verse 37. Again, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations and to put a blue thread in the tassels of the corners and you shall have the tassel that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them and that you may not follow the harlotry to which your own heart and your own eyes are inclined and that you may remember and do all my commandments and be holy to your God, holy for your God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. Through the truth that God has legislated culture, we see a sense of how God has designed us. He has not designed us to be only thinkers. You're not a brain on a stick. We're not made to just think our way into doing truth. We're not just believers. We don't just believe our way into the truth. That's the evangelical concept and model. If you just have all the right beliefs, then you'll live the right life. Except when that doesn't happen, which is a lot of the time. <laughs> Lots of people have all the right beliefs, but they don't do it. We are not primarily thinkers. We're not primarily believers. We are made in God's image, which means we are primarily lovers. We're lovers. And what we have to ask ourselves is, what is it that will direct or misdirect my loves. The things that direct or misdirect our loves are practices. I know it sounds very earthy, it sounds very material, it sounds very unspiritual, but we live in bodies, and these bodies do things every day. And what we do every day affects our loves. You're not going to think your way into doing the right thing and believe your way into doing the right thing, but you will act your way into doing the right thing so many times. This is why we need to consider our practices and evaluate them. You'll notice that when God gives this tassel of blue here, he doesn't present a false dichotomy. He doesn't say, well, you can be spiritual or you can wear the tassel of blue. No, he says, you must wear the tassel blue so you can be spiritual, so you can remember who you are and whose you are. A very formative thing for identity and for spirituality. Sociologists speak of thin practices and thick practices. Thin practices are things that you could do every day, but they don't necessarily shape you as a person. Be tempted to ask everyone how many of you brush your teeth once a day. We don't do that. I think most of us do regularly. Even if you brush your teeth twice a day, you probably don't think of yourself as a toothbrusher. It's a practice, it's a habit, but it doesn't really shape your identity, right? Oh, look at this toothbrush I got. It's amazing. You know, I paid top dollar for it. But there are other things that are formative as practices. For example, do you think that 
owning and using a smartphone is a thin practice or a thick practice? I don't think I want to say it, Brother Wendell. Yeah, I don't. I want it to be a thin practice, but it's thick, very thick. How many times a day do I pull that thing out? How many things can I do with it? My life is completely different with all the options and apps that I have to make my life so much better. Is the wearing of clothing a thin practice or a thick practice? You know, every generation must deal with the cultural issues of their day. There are unique issues. And this message, I'll, I'll just be up front with you about it. This message is time stamped. In other words, it's got an expiration to it. This message is specifically for North American people in 2024. Because there are different cultures across the world that are facing different things. The truths that I'm sharing with you are going to be applied very differently in North Korea or maybe even Israel in 2024. But we're not living in those countries. We're living in America. <laughs> it's our responsibility to deal with the issues that we're facing right now. And what we're facing is the pressure of the group culture around us that is pervasively and invasively persuading us into becoming different kinds of people. Now, I think God's the one who designed group culture to work that way, that we would influence and be influenced within a group. And I think we see that demonstrated as we've looked at in Numbers 15. Secondly, Jonadab leveraged group culture. Somehow he was aware of this thing. And Jonadab, as you may well recall, we find a story about him or his, his offspring, actually, in Jeremiah 35. Uh, he was concerned about his family staying faithful. Not just the immediate family, but generations. I'm assuming that he had maybe a 200-year, eight-generation vision for his family. And you recall that there were certain things that he, you could say arbitrarily, required, commanded of his children. Those things were no, wine, no drinking of wine, no building of houses, no sowing of seed, and no planting of vineyards. And we find out as you look at that, that situation in Jeremiah 35, that it actually worked. Shock of all shocks. The family stayed faithful for generations. In fact, they wouldn't even listen to the prophet who took the alcohol and set it before them. They said, no, we're part of Shippensburg Christian Fellowship. We don't drink alcohol. Well, not quite, but we're part of Jonadab. And God praised them for it. An extra biblical command. God didn't say no alcohol, but Jonadab did, and God said, you are blessed for following this, quote, arbitrary command decades after it was given. So why, why did Jonadab have these requirements? No building of houses, no sowing of seed, no planting of vineyards, no drinking of wine. He wanted his children and grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren to maintain a pilgrim mindset. To remember that they're strangers, even in the midst of a covenant people. <laughs> We're talking about in, in the middle of Israel. To maintain that mindset. The power of group culture. <coughs> You're likely all aware that John, Dad, Martin is part of one of about 30 phone team counselors that take calls from the CAM billboards that are located across the U.S., and I've asked Dad several times to clarify this, and he has done so. He says that different times when he gives a picture of the kingdom to the caller, they are enamored with that. That's beautiful. I never heard that before. That's wonderful. Is anybody doing this? <coughs> Is anybody? And Dad will say, well, have you ever heard of the Mennonites? Most of the time, they'll say, no, I don't know. Who are the Mennonites? And then he'll say, have you ever heard of the Amish? Most of the time, maybe 100%, or at least most of the time, people respond enthusiastically and positively, yes, we know who the Amish are. 
And I've asked the dad this several times because we have mixed feelings about the Amish. I said, are they 100% positive? Aren't there some that are a bit? He said, 100% of the time, they feel positively about the Amish. Jaw dropping. So what that means is, if you're not Amish, and we aren't, people by and large have no idea who we are. We're not making any effective change. But they know about the Amish? Now, I could be cynical and say we don't have the Mennonite romance novels. But I actually feel somewhat kindly about Amish romance novels. I believe that it is tapping into a deep desire that people have for innocence, for intact families, for beauty, for wholesomeness. I'm not saying those books are wholesome, but you look at what the world's got, they don't have anything close. So here are people, the Amish, Old Order Mennonites, Old Order River Brethren, who are simply living the life. And you talk about a high definition culture, high definition. And they aren't even trying to reach out. At least that's the charge. So here the Amish are, not trying. On the other end of the spectrum, you have the evangelical church with their tongues hanging out trying to be relevant, trying to engage the culture, trying to affect change, trying to make a difference. What's happening? <coughs> nothing. Virtually nothing. Virtually no change. No impact. <clears throat> Can't move the needle one bit. Meanwhile, you have this group of people who don't give two hoots about culture, who are affecting change way out of proportion to what they're not trying to do. It's not fair. So when I talk about the turtles beating us, I'm talking about, of course, the well-known fable by Aesop, the tortoise and the hare. You remember that the rabbit, as we would call the, the hare, he was quite confident that he would just beat the tortoise or the turtle if they were to race. And it was due, of course, to the rabbit's overconfidence that the turtle ended up winning the day. So I'm largely speaking about the old order groups when I'm talking about the turtles. And I'm talking about the rest of us in the conservative Anabaptist world when I'm talking about the rabbits. What I'm asking us is, are we willing to wrestle with the implications of group culture? When I talk about the Amish as turtles, I'm not speaking about them in a demeaning way. I have a lot of appreciation. That's my heritage. Probably the reason I know God today, I'm a follower of Jesus, is because of a lot of faithful Amish people. You've probably heard Dale Heisey say, you can have structure without life, but you can't have life without structure. And you can have a shell without a turtle, but you can't have a turtle without a shell. And I'm afraid that too often we've been trying to do that. And while you may think that the old order groups are all shell and no turtle, the reality is there's more life there than you probably think. Like I said, I grew up in Big Valley with all sorts of old order groups. The yellow top, the white top, the black top. And the white toppers, the Nebraska Amish, were considered the most spiritually dark group. Superstitious, uninterested in spiritual things. But I could take you to an old white topper man who had been changed by God, and he was still a white topper, and about every conversation you got into, he would bring it around to God somehow. That's amazing. There was life there, even in the darkest places. What I'm saying is, brethren, as Mennonites, as independent Anabaptists, whatever we are, we can put on these tent meetings, we can make CDs, we can travel in choirs, 
We can hand out tracts. And the nation doesn't seem to have an idea who we are. I'm not opposed to those things. I'm not saying we should stop doing them. Meanwhile, tragedy strikes a small school in nickel mines, and the world is fixated for a week. Is it possible that the turtles are beating us? <coughs> so Jonadab leveraged the power of group culture for the sake of multi-generational faithfulness. What am I saying about the Amish, the Old Orders, and the turtles? <laughs> I'm not saying that I plan to become a turtle. What I'm encouraging us is to be willing to identify with the turtles and to leverage their influence. What I'm saying is if we can't beat the turtles, let's ride them to victory. When somebody comes up to me and says, are you Amish? Or they say that to you, don't be offended. Now don't pretend to be. Ah, yeah. Ich kann nicht wetter. Some of you can. <clears throat> but I think what we can say is, well, something like that. No, I'm not Amish. I don't have a horse and buggy. But something like that. People really don't care about the 37 different nuances of what makes you different from the sister church over there in St. Thomas. They don't. What I'm saying is, <coughs> the Amish, the Old Orders, have accrued a lot of cultural capital that is very positively viewed by the society at large. We have the opportunity to come along and leverage that capital for kingdom purposes. That's what we can do if we're willing to not be offended. Ah, I'm not Amish. I'm not older Mennonite. You know, we're constantly being told that in order to make a difference, we need to stand out and be ourselves. Maybe in God's kingdom, the way to have an enduring influence is to actually conform to the group and become what they encourage us to become through shared practices. That cultural message is driving us every day without fail without relenting. Be yourself. Be your own person. Find out who you are. The liberal churches keep saying to the, to the uh, conservative churches, you must become relevant or die. And year after year, wise conservative churches refuse to become relevant and continue to live. Meanwhile, it's the liberal church folk who continue hemorrhaging people and end up fading away. And this is very personal to me, because just less than three months ago, the, the church that I pastored at Pleasant Valley closed its doors after 84 and a half years. An unwillingness to grapple with group culture. And incidentally, the church that we attended in our early marriage closed its doors last August. God's principles are still as true as the day that uh, Paul stated them. He said that God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. He's chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised he has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. Before you go off making wisecracks about straw hats and covering strings, I want you to remember that God is in the habit of using nothings the things that don't matter, that don't seem necessary, to affect change way out of proportion to what we would ever expect. He's using the nothings of society to accomplish a lot more than whatever amazing spiritual answer we might think that we have, if indeed we have an arrogant and high-minded concept. God uses conformity to a larger movement and yieldedness to local groups to carry out his kingdom purposes. I'm very tired of these men who have some amazing idea that doesn't quite jive with the local church, so they go off and do their own little thing at their home, home churching, because nobody sees it quite like I do. You are not going to affect positive, enduring, long-term change by living that way. You need to backslide a little bit and learn to live with a brotherhood with some things that push you a little bit and stretch you 
and maybe even cause you to give up some preferences. I have. There are things that, Pleasant, uh, that uh, Shippensburg has said, we are going to do this as a brotherhood, and I'd say, oh, I'd rather not do that, but I'm willing to do it. Personally, I wouldn't borrow money from family, but the church is okay with that. I'm willing to yield to that. And that's just one of several things. Are we willing to yield? Our problem is not an inability to conform, it's an unwillingness to yield. And that's the value of group culture. It helps to surface that selfishness. The third point. I really believe that Jesus lived group culture. God legislated it, Jonadab leveraged it, and Jesus lived it. I know that sounds like an audacious claim. I really believe that the tenor, the overall sense of Jesus' life and ministry was one of yieldedness to a larger group culture. You remember that when God chose to send his son into a culture, he chose a highly defined one. And, of course, it was the one that he had directly influenced. If you look at the main characters of the incarnation, the birth of Jesus, God chose devout Jewish people. Zacharias and Elizabeth, very culturally conservative. Joseph and Mary, Anna and Simeon, definitely Torah observant. But did Jesus care about group culture? That's the question. Did he care about it? Did he live it? Did he live any unnecessary distinctive dress? I believe he did. We read about it in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You'll find in those various passages that there were accounts of either women or lots of people touching the hem of his garment. What does that mean? He had a really good seamstress? Is a really amazing hem? No, in my studying, the best I can tell, the best that any of the, quote, experts can say is it really seems to be re referencing that original blue tassel that God legislated in Numbers. <coughs> Jesus was yielding to a hundreds of years old group culture requirement. And God used that to bring about positive healing change for many people. I'm really getting weary of people who want to recreate a casual Jesus in their image. A Jesus who doesn't care about group culture. They keep trying it. It keeps not working. They keep hoping for better results. Frankly, we need tangible, habitual practices that inculcate and cultivate the sorts of virtues that turn independence into interdependence that rejects casualness and turns expressive individualism into appreciation for and submission to a group. So young men, I've been looking at you, talking to you today, but everybody else as well. <laughs> we live in a unique culture. Every culture is unique. Every time is unique. What is unique to this culture? What is it that we have to think about as leaders in the church? We need to think about expressive individualism. Expressive individualism says you must not just not only tolerate my identity that I have chosen, but you must support it wholeheartedly, no matter what that identity is. I get to choose it, but you have to support it. In order for me to be authentic and true to myself, I have to figure out who I am. And not only am I a come-outer, I am a stand-outer. I express myself. You must accept that expression and support it. I realize these are $10 words here, but I have another $10 word, existentialism. Existentialism is the idea that existence comes before essence. In other words, the only thing that I really know is that I exist. And then out of that, I try to figure out who I want to be and who I want to become. There is no prior uh, claims on me, no ultimate allegiances, um, no responsibilities. All I know is that I have to figure out for myself what I should be and who my real self is. And that underlying philosophy has been seeping through our churches. It would make sense if it was out there in the world, but it's seeping through. I mean, it's just 
in pl certain places, it's running roughshod through our ranks. It makes people suspicious of authority and, in fact, hostile to it. It disrespects, disregards, and discards history and tradition. It promotes independence and leads to isolation. In fact, in many ways, expressive individualism and existentialism are anti-culture. I heard a pastor and author, an evangelical man, just recently in a podcast interview, he made this observation, John Tyson. He said, anti-culture is the annihilation and hunting down of any settled convictions. Culture is organizing chaos for flourishing. And anti-culture is hunting down boundaries and convictions and destroying them. And I think that's what we're seeing with identity. He said, there's no ordering the raw elements of life under some divine vision. It's just a radical self-expression based on whatever economic, sexual, political, even theological categories that you want. It's the idea that I'm going to do what I want to do and nobody's going to tell me any different. No group, no tradition, no history. I am the arbiter of myself. And you may not tell me what to do. I'm very concerned about the growing rise of anti-authority. I think it's in our churches. I really do. I'm concerned about what is happening uh, in, in our midst. The concept. You remember that man that I talked about in the church that Heather and I attend? Shorts and loud t-shirts. Casualness. Casualness. And yet, is our casualness communicating anything different than his casualness? Do casual clothes communicate anything different than dress clothes when I come to church? I mean, let's be realistic here. We're talking about group culture. If everybody came to church the same, would we all look like lumberjacks? <laughs> I don't see any buffalo plaids here this morning. Uh, but we could. We, we could have a group culture that's buffalo plaid, lumberjacks. On the other hand, if everybody came dressed like me, all the men, we would all look like penguins. <laughs> Maybe that's what God wants. What I'm saying is, do we think about how we are contributing or pulling away from the fabric of the brotherhood? and the group culture. Casual clothes communicate. What if the entire church wore casual footwear? Are jeans really that much different from dress pants? And I'm, I'm thinking that we've reacted to formality a bit, formal attire, because we've, we've linked it to formality. It's just, it's just an empty ritual, formal, formality, formal attire. And yet this is going in the wrong direction. Dressing casually, dressing casually, communicates a lack of purpose. Now that might not, might not be the intention. Not the man that attended the church there where we were at, I'm sure he didn't intend to communicate that, but that's what the clothes were saying, a lack of purpose, a lack of intention. And I have to ask myself, is that really how we want to come worship God? The God who is a consuming fire. Dare we just show up, however, Casually? Is it possible that casualness is killing us spiritually? Perhaps that's why they're called casualties. It's the same root word. On the flip side, formal and formality have to do with how we are formed. It's not all negative, brothers and sisters. There is value in formality. Formal may mean improper form or may imply excessive emphasis on empty form. I think that's been the reaction, this excessive em emphasis on empty form. That's not what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about improper conduct. Is it possible that the things we threw off as empty form were actually tremendously formative of our identity? If you came to church on purpose to worship God this morning, is your clothing saying the opposite? 
or are you a reverse hypocrite? Sure, we can show up to church formally attired and not actually worship God, but we can also show up to church very informally and casually attired and expect that that's going to communicate purposefulness somehow in worshiping God. I'm looking for the things that have enduring value, those practices and habits that shape our loves into people who have durability and endurance. And the question we must wrestle with is, how do we build anything that's going to go upstream against this existentialism and this expressive individualism that is swamping us? It's going to probably have to be a few arbitrary things that you can't chapter and verse, but are very important for identity formation. Because if we're not going to do identity formation, the world will. It's not a question of if, it's a question of who. We will be influenced by group culture, but which one will be the strongest in shaping our identity? Will it be our family? Will it be our church? Will it be the broader culture? It's going to take awareness and intention on our part. That's why group culture is such a vital thing to consider. Our main problem is not an inability to conform, but an unwillingness to yield. I'm imploring you young men, recognize the dangers of this culture. Purpose in your heart that you are going to stand against this shift and drift. The idea of letting it all hang out. Now, I'll be very candid with you about what I'm asking. I am not asking for all of our men to wear the plain suit. I'm asking for all of our men and women to look kindly on the plain suit. There's a huge difference. A huge difference. I don't wear the plain suit nearly as much as my father-in-law. But a person who's willing to wear it even once or twice a year is exponentially in a different category than one who says, I will never wear that thing at all, and says so with an attitude. It's not the wearing or not wearing it that's going to kill us. It's that attitude if we allow it to fester and live. So I'm not saying that everybody has to adopt this. What I'm saying is, can we appreciate our heritage? And on a more practical level, can we at least smile at each other at Walmart? <laughs> I'm not talking about us as a church family. I'm talking about that person you see that's more liberal or more conservative, but you know they're Anabaptist. And I know a lot of Anabaptists out there just don't smile. We've got a lot of smile work to do. <laughs> but we're family. We're all part of the Anabaptist world. Let's smile at each other. We love Jesus. We want the kingdom to go forward. We want something of enduring value. I want to address just a couple, a couple objections to plain clothing, particularly to the suit. Jesus didn't purposely dress in such a way as to stand out in his culture. Why should we? Well, that's an assumption we're making, that he didn't stand out. I would say that, in all likelihood, the entire culture was different. To dress Jewish was not to dress Roman, was not to dress Gentile, was not to dress Greek. And so you automatically knew the Jewish man and woman by their dress. If you're part of a culture like that, you don't want to stand out. You want to blend in. You want to support the group culture. Number two, why can't we just dress simply, inexpensively, and modestly? I think this argument would hold more water if we applied it equally to both sides of the house. If we're going to use that argument, I can make a very strong case that our women should be going to the thrift store for skirts and blouses, which are very inexpensive. It saves the time of sewing, and it would just save a lot of money and hassle and headache. What we have to remember is, while simplicity and inexpensiveness is part of the equation, it's not the only part. If you're going to pull one part out and make it the thing, we can go off into all sorts of directions. As far as simplicity, there's a difference between simplicity and plainness. Steve Jobs, the CEO of Apple, was a very simple dressing man. All he wore for the duration of most of his business life was a black turtleneck t-shirt, jeans, 
and New Balance sneakers. That's simple. If simplicity is our only measure, then we all should adopt that. But it's not. We're, considered, but we're considering this matter of plainness. The difference between simplicity is simplicity is a function of individualism. I can be simple in so many different ways that point to me as an individual, but I can only be plain in a way that has been identified and agreed upon as a group. Shippensburg did not come up with the idea of how formal attire should be for men in a plain setting. We didn't cook it up. No individual came up with it as far as we know, no individual church. And so what we're doing by a willingness to yield to plainness, not just simplicity, is I am willing to yield myself to a bigger group. Frankly, I don't have a conviction for the plain suit, but I have a conviction to be yielded. Isn't that what we want for all of us? That's the only way brotherhood works, brothers. Simplicity is a function of individualism and can actually foster it. Plainness is a function of the corporate and actually fosters brotherhood. We must not absolutize one characteristic to another when it comes to simple, inexpensive, modest. <clears throat> if modesty was all that mattered, then any sort of feed sack arrangement would work. It's the to total picture. It's gender distinction. It is simplicity. It is about the, the, the modesty. A third and final Objection, plain suits are too expensive. Now, I know many a man who's willing to spend hundreds of dollars on just the right tool, or just the right hunting equipment, or just the right doodad for his car. We're talking about something that has the potential for powerful, ongoing, social and spiritual formation. How much is it worth to you for your son to learn to die to himself and take up his cross and follow Christ? It doesn't just happen with a plain suit. They can learn to do it without that. But I'm bringing this up because it is so effective in that regard. You might have something that's even more effective. Great, let's do it. But what is it worth for our youth, and our young men especially, to learn to yield and to identify with a bigger group? It has to happen in our bodies, with our bodies, on our bodies, whatever it is that you choose to do, to be formative in identity. What is spiritual formation worth to you? My desire, brothers and sisters, is for us as a church family here at Shippensburg Christian Fellowship to do well and to endure 200 years. I don't want us to only go 84 and a half years and die. I want us to flourish all the way till Jesus comes. That's my desire. But the only way we're going to do that is if we actually reckon with the cultural realities in which we find ourselves. And like I said, that could change very quickly. <laughs> this message could become outdated tomorrow. But right now, this is where we're at. This is what we're facing. My desire is that each of our children here in this congregation, to at least the eighth generation, would choose to be a part of a family, that chooses to be part of a brotherhood, that chooses to be part of a movement, that choose to be part of the kingdom of God. My hope is not in the Anabaptist movement, but I have great hopes for the Anabaptist movement. In closing, thank you to my parents, Dad and Mom Byler, for raising me to go against the flow of the world, but to fit into the flow of the kingdom. It's a priceless gift. Brothers and sisters, let's be realistic. We probably aren't as fast as we think. 
And the turtles out there are likely accomplishing more than we would ever want to imagine. My desire is to cultivate your awareness of the power of culture in general and a sense of appreciation for our tribe in particular. Our main problem is not an inability to conform. It's an unwillingness to yield. Is there any comment? I'm open to pushback, feedback, critique, yelling and screaming. Thank you. I want you to know that I'm very open to your input. If you want to come and address me about anything, I don't, I'm not coming to you with all the answers. I'm coming to you with a lot of questions, a lot of observations, a lot of concerns. And to me, it highlights the fact that I need you. I need the brotherhood because I don't have the answers myself. On the other hand, I think the brotherhood doesn't have all the answers, and that's why we need a broader movement even, the historical movement, the historic faith, the broader Anabaptist world around, uh, around the world, uh, we really do need more than just us to be faithful all the way to the end. And I want to foster that, that desire of faithfulness, a connection of appreciation for the broader Anabaptist world. So I really believe that, that uh, you are going to be an enduring bunch because you endured through such a long sermon. Thank you for your time. and your, I, I really take it um, seriously and, and appreciate it. Um, your, your attention. Let's stand for closing prayer and then we'll have a song. <laughs>